Well, we are in the middle of a series on God's promises. And so I, I thought it would be appropriate for us to uh, select a Bible memory verse for the month that focused in on one of those promises from God. Now, you guys, Scripture is loaded with God's promises for us, right? And, and many of us have probably read through a number of them, maybe even memorized a few of them um, over the course of our lives. And that's okay. I don't want you to lose any of those. But I'd like you to try to work on this new one with us this month, okay? From Isaiah 41.10, which says, So do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. That is a great promise for all of us all the time. But you guys, I feel like it's even more for this world where we're at right now. All right, so, so here's the thing. This, this passage up here, we can break it down into four short, shorter phrases, okay? Each phrase, only about eight words long. So here's the challenge, all right? It, you've, this is like where we, where are we at, like the 7th of February today, right? All right, so even so, you've got time. If you, if you just focus on, you know, one of those phrases per week, and you might have to double up on the last week because February is always a short month, right? But, um, but you're only looking at like eight to ten words per week that you have to learn to memorize this passage by the end of the month. So I want to challenge you to do that. Commit it to memory. All right, moving on to today's message. Today, as, uh, as Carrie mentioned, I want to take us on a journey examining God's grace throughout history. History, it's been said, is his story, right? God's story, God working in and through the lives of all people. So we are a part of that narrative. Our story flows out of his story. And it's inextricably fused with it. You guys, there would be no our story without his story. And today we're going to look at grace that flows through God's story and how he chose people by his grace. And the story we're going to look at this morning is a story of Jacob and Esau. And it's about grace. And, and you guys, it doesn't always make sense. From a human perspective, grace doesn't make sense from a purely human or even a sometimes logical perspective. Sometimes it's just mysterious and we don't understand it, but that's grace. And it can be difficult to wrap our minds around. And and a lot of times I think people get the mercy and the grace confused. They they go together a lot of times, right? Mercy, it's been said, is, is not getting the punishment you deserve. And grace is getting good things you don't deserve. Well, I'm going to be sharing most, mostly with you this morning from Genesis 27, the story of Jacob and Esau. And we'll get there in a moment. But first, I thought we'd just get a little bit of a running start, okay? So we're going to back up to a brief passage from their grandpa's story, okay? Grandpa Abraham, found in Genesis chapter 11, which says, this is the account of Terah's family line. That's actually his father. Terah became the father of Abram, Nahor, and Haran. And Haran became the father of Lot, And while his father Terah was still alive, Haran died in Ur of the Chaldeans in the land of his birth. And Abram and Nahor both married. The name of Abram's wife was Sarai, and the name of Nahor's wife was Milcah, and she was the daughter of Haran, the father of both Milcah and Iscah. Now Sarai was childless because she was not able to conceive. And Terah took his son Abram, his grandson Lot, uh, his grandson Lot, son of Haran, and his daughter-in-law Sarai, the wife of his son Abram, and together they set out from Ur of the Chaldeans to go to Canaan. But when they came to Haran, they settled there. And Terah lived 205 years, and he died in Haran. Now, what did you notice about that passage as we just kind of zipped through? What details can you glean? Let me throw a few of the ones up there that I saw, okay? First of all, Abraham. We see that he was the son of a guy named Terah. He had brothers named Nahor and and Haran. His brother Haran had a son named Lot. He and his family members had strange names, at least to those of us here in Western culture, right? Right? Okay, and then, and then Haran, Haran died. And Abram and Nahor both married, Sarai and, and, and Milcah, respectively. Abram and Sarai were childless. And then Terah moved with his son Abram and grandson Lot to Haran. Now, what do you notice about that list? You see it? Yeah, I got nothing either. I mean, there's, there's nothing really notable about that list, is there? I mean, there really isn't. I mean, if you change the names and the places a little bit, uh, we could be talking about anybody on the planet at just about any time in history, right? I mean, there's nothing really noteworthy there. 
Right? Abram was just an average, ordinary guy, just like millions or even billions of other average, ordinary guys throughout history. In fact, some would go so far as to say that Abram was a nobody. But the next thing scripture says about Abram is this. Verse 12, the Lord had said to Abram, go from your country, your people and your father's household to the land I will show you. Okay, it's actually chapter 12, sorry. But okay, so, so God speaking to a guy and telling him to move to some undisclosed location. That's a little interesting. That's a little different, right? But not as much as what comes next. God said, I will make you into a great nation. And I will bless you. I will make your name great and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and whoever curses you, I will curse. And all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. Bam! Out of nowhere, God decides to bless this guy and change the course of his life and not just his life, but everyone all around the planet because he's going to bless all peoples through this guy. There was no warning, no indicators at all that this was coming into Abraham's life. It just kind of came out of nowhere, kind of like this next audience participation illustration. Ready? Okay. So I have, I, earlier this week, I came in and I, I, I got out my phone and, and I got on Google. You guys, Google is a, is a great instrument for some things. And if you're looking for a random number generator, it's really cool. Okay, so all you got to do is plug in numbers. So I randomly selected a seat in this room using my little random number generator. Okay, first of all, I, I had to pick a number of rows. So there's 11 rows of seats in this, uh, in this, in this room. Right, so a random number generator picked that that row for me, and then I counted how many seats were in that row and plugged those numbers in, and it randomly selected a seat in this room. And there's one seat in this room that, at least as of this morning, um, had an envelope taped to the bottom of the seat, okay, right under the front of the seat, um, with something kind of cool inside of it. All right, and I just happened to know as I'm looking out here that. There is actually a person sitting in that seat. So congratulations. All right. If as like, I get it, it's still there as long as I was. Um, and now that you've all had a, chan- a fun chance to look around for a little bit, I can let you know, Mr. Ray, you're the one. It's, it's under your seat. It should be. So um, if you need a hand, you know, getting it out of there, I, I, I think I taped it up there pretty good. Unless it fell and somebody moved it, <laughs> that should be row four. Right there on the aisle. Am I right? Awesome. There we go. Um, Enjoy, my friend, okay? Um, It's just just a a fun little gift card, you guys. But hey, you know what? I want to tell you something. I thought, I, I thought about putting that envelope in one of the seats front center here to reward somebody who sat on the front row closer to the speaker, right? But then I had to remind myself, no, no, this is all about grace. And, and, and that would have been giving it to somebody who in some way kind of sort of deserved it. And that would have blown the whole illustration because, because grace is unearned. It's undeserved. And sometimes it's kind of mysterious, right? We don't always get it. But that brings us to our first two road signs on this morning's journey through history. Number one, God's richest blessings are not something we earn or deserve. Okay? Number two, Abraham was chosen by God out of all the people on the world to demonstrate God's grace and also to provide a solution to man's problem of sin. Okay, so now we need to fast forward in our story, our timeline a little bit to the the days of Abraham's son Isaac. And we actually catch up with him when he himself is very old. We read in Genesis chapter 27, when Isaac was old, His eyes were so weak he could no longer see. He called for Esau, his older son, and said to him, My son, here I am, he answered. Isaac said, I'm now an old man, and and I don't know the day of my death. Now then, get your equipment, your quiver and your bow, and, and go out to the open country to hunt some wild game for me. Prepare me the kind of tasty food I like and bring it to me to eat so that I may give you my blessing before I die. You guys... The blessing in these days was incredibly important in this culture to these people, okay? In those days, the blessing was the pinnacle of prayers for a parent to their child. 
It usually contains sentiments about the parent's hopes and dreams for the future of this child. And in most cases, God used it in sort of a prophetic sense to enact these things, these dreams, these hopes in the life of that child. Usually in this culture, it was, it was the firstborn son, which in this case was Esau, who would receive the very best of their father's blessings by far. Okay, so that's, that's what we're talking about here. Isaac said, I'm going to give you this blessing. So just bring me this tasty food, and then I will give you my blessing. All right, so we pick it up. The next verse, it says, Now Rebekah, Isaac's wife, was listening as Isaac spoke to his son Esau. And when Esau left for the open country to hunt game and bring it back, Rebekah said to her son Jacob, Look, I overheard your father say to your brother Esau, Bring me some game and prepare me some tasty food to eat, so that I may give you my blessing in the presence of the Lord before I die. Now, my son, listen carefully and do what I tell you. Go out to the flock. Bring me two choice young goats so I can prepare some tasty food for your father just the way he likes it. Then take it to your father to eat so that he may give you his blessing before he dies. And that's exactly what they did. Rebecca and Jacob. They schemed, they plotted, they act on their, acted on their scheme, and they totally tricked Isaac. And the end result being that, that Jacob received Isaac's blessing. But then he had to run for his life because his brother Esau was pretty ticked, right? Jacob was a scoundrel. I mean, his name, Jacob, he was named Jacob for two reasons. First of all, because Jacob means he grasps the heel. He was Esau's twin. Esau came out first and Jacob was grabbing onto his heel as they were coming out of the womb. And secondly, his name also means he deceives and how appropriate for his deception. Tricked Esau out of his birthright earlier, and now out of his blessing, just outright stole it from him. So God took this guy and blessed him, even though he was a bit of a scoundrel and a swindler and, and stole the blessing and cheated him out of his birthright. Unfair? Yeah. Kind of seems like it, doesn't it? Okay, but we, we look a little closer. So Jacob swindled his brother out of his birthright, stole his blessing. Um, but, flip the coin over for a second, Esau was not such a great guy either. When you think about it, um, Esau didn't value his birthright more than a bowl of bean soup, right? Um, he was pretty short-sighted when it came to giving that away. And, and then also, he didn't have the same respect for God that his father did. And he, he married a couple of women from the surrounding people, not from, not from the, the God followers in his family, but from the surrounding people who did not follow after God. And then when he realized that that was a, a stinky problem to his parents, he actually went and married someone else from their extended family to try to appease them. So neither of these two men, Jacob or Esau, seem to have been really top shelf candidates for God's best blessings and promises. So why did God choose Jacob? I mean, he could have chosen either of them. And, and, and cultural norms would have favored Esau, right, as the older son. But remember, it's all about grace. God's incredible, undeserved, and occasionally mysterious grace. And before they were born, God told their mother, while they were still in the womb, the Lord said to her, two nations are in your womb. Two peoples from within you will be separated. One people will be stronger than the other. And get this, and the older will serve the younger. So God had already decided before they were even born that Jacob was going to come out on top. And I, guys, I just got to kind of wonder how things might have played out if 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 mom and Jacob would have allowed God to do things his way rather than intervening in their way and trying to make it happen on their own, you know, because God was going to work it out anyway. But instead, they got involved and they did it. And in, and, and in so doing, Jacob ended up on the run because his brother was mad, upset about the whole thing. So God had a plan to bless Jacob even before he was born. So our next signpost on this journey of grace through history is this. Jacob was chosen by God despite his birth order and his character. So God didn't choose him because of his flaws, but rather in spite of his flaws. Jacob was a rascal, <laughs> scoundrel, deceiver. He did not deserve God's grace. 
But God still chose him, and God's grace still flowed out to him. In Genesis chapter 28, we catch up with Jacob as he's on his journey to find a wife for himself from among his own people. Genesis 28, beginning at verse 10, Jacob left Beersheba and set out for Haran. And when he reached a certain place, he stopped for the night because the sun had set. Taking one of the stones there, he put it under his head and he lay down to sleep. He had a dream in which he saw a stairway resting on the earth with its top reaching to heaven. And the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. And there above it stood the Lord. And he said, I am the Lord, the God of your father, Abraham, and the God of Isaac. I will give you and your descendants the land on which you are lying. Your descendants will be like the dust of the earth. And you will spread out to the west and to the east and to the north and to the south. And all peoples will be blessed through you and your offspring. I am with you and will watch over you wherever you go. And I will bring you back to this land. I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised you. God's incredible promises and God's grace. The undeserved favor of God. Now, our final step on this journey this morning takes us hundreds of years down the line to the time of Jesus. John the Baptist had been baptizing the people in the river and preaching about repentance. And, it, and it's at this point that we read in John chapter 1, verse 29. The next day, John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is the one I meant when I said, a man who comes after me has surpassed me because he was before me. I myself did not know him, but the reason I came baptizing with water was that he might be revealed to Israel. John continues, he said, he then gave this testimony. I saw the spirit come down from heaven as a dove and remain on him. I myself did not know him, but the one who sent me to baptize with water told me, the man on whom you see the Spirit come down and remain is the one who will baptize with the Holy Spirit. I have seen and I testify that this is God's chosen one. You guys, Jesus wasn't Abraham. Jesus wasn't like Abraham or Isaac or Jacob. Jesus was different. Jesus was unique. He was and is God's chosen one, the Lamb of God, the only person ever to walk the face of this planet without sin, which makes these next statements even more profound. We read them in John 3, 16 and 17, some very well-known verses. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world but to save the world through him. And the apostle Paul wrote in Romans 5.8, God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, while we were still scoundrels, while we were still stinkers, God died for us. Christ died for us. And the final signpost on our journey this morning says that God showed his incredible love for us through the story of Jesus. Are you getting this? Abraham's story, Isaac's story, Jacob's story, Jesus' story, our story, they're all intertwined with God's divine story of grace and redemption. You guys, God wasn't ready to leave things as they were after the Garden of Eden, after Adam and Eve messed up and sinned. He wasn't willing to leave humanity in that broken state. He wasn't about to just write us off. Instead, he enacted a plan right then that carried all the way down through history that God would use his incredible love and his grace to provide a way out for us. And that grace all came through Jesus his one and only son. You have been chosen by God through his great grace and compassion to receive his ultimate gifts, forgiveness and adoption into his family. Which brings us to our, our three big takeaways for today. Three degrees of grace. Okay, by grace, by the grace of God, Abram showed us that God can love a nobody. And Jacob showed us that God can love anybody. <laughs> anybody. You guys, anybody. Doesn't matter what they've done. Doesn't matter how, what an incredible stinker they are. God can love anybody. 
And Jesus showed us that God loves everybody. 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 God's story, his story, and our story don't end here. God has appointed each one of us who have experienced his grace and his mercy and his forgiveness and his adoption. He's appointed us to share those great gifts, those great promises with the other people that we encounter in this life. Even the ones who are stinkers. Even the ones that we try to avoid. God has appointed us to share those great things with them. Now, if you're wondering this morning, you know, what your, might, your next step might be on this journey in your life. First of all, I'd like you to think in your life, those people that you encounter day to day, week to week, might be your family, might be your friends, might be your neighbors, might be the people you see at the store occasionally. God puts those people in your path for a reason. He wants to share his grace with them as well. So one of, our, one of our steps may be to prayerfully think, how can I help that person? How can I share that the next time I meet that person that crosses my path rather than just putting up the blinders? Next step might be that you need to seek out a place to grow. And you guys, I've mentioned this before, we all need a place to grow. And I know this past year has been absolutely horrific for it from a COVID perspective, but we are starting to baby step our way back into smaller groups. And I was just telling a guy yesterday, I was down at the men's conference and I got a chance to sit at a table with guy and we got into a conversation and we were just talking about the need for, for people to experience life in smaller groups Guys, this is wonderful. This is a wonderful time for us to dig into his word once a week, you know, but it's really one-sided. We need two-sided conversations to continue the growth process so we can encourage and sharpen and pray for each other. So I want to encourage you in the days ahead to find a place to grow, to plug in with a smaller group so that you can continue to grow. We're going to be launching up to about four of them starting about February 28th. Okay, four new groups, and they're going to take place different times, different days of the week. I'm basing that based on the surveys that I'm seeing. Um, and if you, got, you know, if, if you have an interest in that, please let me know, you know, like what time, what day, what kind of thing works for you. But we're going to be launching those things because we recognize the importance of that interaction. We've got to encourage each other and challenge each other and pray for each other. So I want to encourage you to be, to be prayerfully thinking right now, where's a good group that I can get plugged in? place to grow. But don't stop there, okay? You also need a place to serve. These two things are like breathing in and breathing out. You breathe in, it's really good, but you don't stay there, right? You got to breathe out too. It's like exercising our muscles, all right? We got to breathe in and breathe out, place to grow, breathe in, place to serve, breathe it out. And in the days ahead, again, as we are stepping back into more normal life around the church and figuring out how to do things in new ways, we're going to need volunteers in the area of children's ministries and more in the area of youth and adults and tech and front office and facility maintenance and greeters. We're going to need pretty much all over the board people stepping up to say, yeah, I can help with that. Yeah, I can help with that. Yeah, I can serve the body that way. So I want you to prayerfully be thinking, how can you be serving in the body? place to serve. Maybe you're here this morning and you know what? You've come in this morning and you're ready for a a message from the Lord and I hope that God has, has revealed to you some of his promises and his incredible grace for you this morning. But maybe you walked in and you're carrying this incredible load this morning and I don't know. I don't know what it might be from something that's going on in your life, something that's weighing on your heart, or maybe it's even needing God's grace in your life. You're realizing, I messed up. (laughs) I could use his grace right now. And if that's the case, I, I would just encourage you this morning to take that burden, whatever it is, and lay it at the feet of the Father. Because I got good news for you. His grace extends to you, and he wants to carry that for you. We are not capable 
of carrying everything this life throws at us. Not by a long shot. So let God in his incredible grace and mercy come alongside you and take those things. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we just want to thank you this morning for this time that we could share together. God, it's so good to be together with brothers and sisters in Christ in the same room to see each other, to get to interact on this level. God, we realize that that our world is still in process and there are so many that are still isolated and, and need your touch and need the touch and the interaction with other people. And God, we just would ask that you would continue to open up doors of opportunity for us to share whether it's picking up the phone, stopping by somebody's house, or just seeing them on the street. God, show us how we can be sharing your love and your grace with the people around us. And God, I also want to just pray for those who have walked in this morning carrying a heavy load in their hearts, on their lives. God, I pray that you would come alongside, just tap them on the shoulder and say, let me take that. Because I know, God, that you do. You want to take those burdens from us and let you worry about them. God, I pray that you would just ease those burdens. Help us to look to you as our source of strength in the days ahead. God, we love you so much. And all God's people said, amen.